Well, folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that sound, because it's time for another episode of the Rick Poker Podcast. This is a chats edition, but we also have a forums edition every week, just talking strategy. I'm your host, Rob Washam, Rabman50 in the home game, and Rabman50 on Twitter. And we have the best freaking job in the world, talking poker with our friends here on the podcast every Monday night at 7.30 Eastern, live on YouTube. So join us every week for free and win a prize. All right, we're going to be talking to Lexi Gavin Mather in a moment. But first, I have to mention that we are brought to you by Running Aces, the official sponsor of the Rec Poker Podcast. Most of what we do here is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization, so we depend on support from our sponsors and also from our premium members who take part in our training material and study opportunities for only $15 a month. Do you like talking poker with friends for less than 50 cents a day? Come connect over Zoom with other fun, encouraging poker players, all trying to get better. Or sign up for free, because everything starts with a free account at rec.poker, where all you need to join is an email address and a smile. But remember, you can always get your first month of premium for only $5 by using code RECPOKER at checkout. Now, they are letting me host the show today, but I am only one man, and it takes a group 
a gang, a village, a crew to make all the magic happen around here. We call this group of wizards the Wrecking Crew. And if you want to learn more about me or the rest of the Wrecking Crew, just go to wreck.poker slash crew, or you can just listen up because you're about to meet a few of them right now on the air, starting with producing co-host Chris Jones. My name is Joe Coolis. Um, you can find me at Joe Cool PhD on Twitter as well as Blue Sky. Uh, and my role around here is to provide uh, to uh, provide the training in terms of psychological aspects of poker and how uh, knowledge of those uh, aspects can lead to an improvement in your game. And I'm John Somsky, also known as Poker Geek MN Everywhere, and I help coordinate our home games. And Keith Graf is pulling a Somsky because he is muted. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. I'm, I'm Keith Brandt. That's Monkey System online just about everywhere. And I run the Monkey's Off-Table Tools segment in Rec Poker every month. Okay. I'm so pleased to be joined this week by Lexi Gavin Mather. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Lexi. And if our audience didn't know you, how would you define your own role in the poker world? Hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me. I always love chatting with the Wreck Poker podcast or the Wrecking Crew. Your your theme should your theme song should be Miley Cyrus Wrecking Ball. <laughs> yeah. Right. If we could get the copyright rights, maybe yeah. we should. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but you don't want to see any of us flying in on a, on a wrecking ball with self-nude, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, I would call myself professional poker player and poker coach. Um, but I I really say that I'm all things poker. I am a, an, a new author of a poker book called Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Tournaments. Um, I am a poker TV host. I co-host Poker Night in America on CBS Sports. Um, and I own a poker training site called the Poker Accelerator. So our poker training course. So really all things poker, but I'd say professional poker player and coach is top two. <laughs> cool. And I'd like to ask, what about the Poker Accelerator course? How does that all work? And how did you come about, I guess, creating this uh, poker course? So um, I've been a coach, a, a coach for PokerCoaching.com for the last five years, and um, a lot of the content on that site, that the site is absolutely great, but I find that a lot of the content is um, more for, it, it's not for very big beginner players. Um, you have to have like an understanding of poker. And with my course, you have to, ha you have to know the, the very, very basics. You have to know the rules. Um, but it's geared more towards like the beginner slash, you know, recreational player. And it's more of a, of a transformation. So it kind of goes in chronic chronological order of what, what I think is the most important to start and kind of takes you on that journey to be able to, um, hopefully be profitable. So, um, yeah, it's called the poker accelerator. You can check it out at LexiGavinMather.com. Lexi with a Y and, uh, yeah. That's very cool. It sounds like your poker course would fit very well with the type of audience that we would find here at Rec Poker. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like it's very Rec Poker friendly. So right. that's that's kind of exciting because I agree with you when I look at a lot of the poker coaching content out there and not just pokercoaching.com, but any of the major poker, poker coaching sites, they seem to really have gone to the next level up and are dealing with people that are in the, you know, poker on the poker felt like 40 hours a week. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> and, and the content over there is, is absolutely amazing. And I actually still yes. coach with them. Uh, so if, if you peep, you know, whoever's watching does want to check out like the poker coaching.com, uh, you can try poker coaching.com slash Lexi for three free days of their premium uh, content. So, um, yeah, Jonathan Little was great. He was very supportive of me starting my own course. Um, I find what 
separates me from a lot of the other coaches is that I'm a female and I actually, uh, I do private coaching as well. And I was told by Jonathan Little's team that I was one of the most highly requested private coaches. And I think it might have to do with, with maybe the fact that I'm a female and you, you just don't get a female's perspective that often um, when it comes to coaching. So that's very true. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you about your new book um, and the process of writing a book. I mean, that's got to be a huge endeavor. Yeah. And I know that you're very busy because I watch your vlogs. I see that you're traveling all over the world playing poker and uh, you and Bob are doing it, you know, doing it upright. So how did this new book come about and what was that process of writing it uh, like? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for watching the vlog. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was kind of crazy. Um, I was approached, approached to write the book. Um, actually Jonathan Little had reached out to me. I have, I have a lot of thanks and gratitude for him for a lot of my career. Um, he approached me asking if I'd be interested in writing the book because, the, um, our publishers shout out to dnbpoker.com because Dan and Byron are absolutely amazing. I think you guys are having them on the pod next week. Yes, uh, we are. Yeah. So they were looking for someone to write this book called Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Tournaments. And um, it was actually the the year that I was planning my wedding, um, which I had no idea how much of an undertaking that would be. <laughs> and uh, I was like, are you sure you guys want me? Like, I'm not an author. I'm I'm a poker player. And they're like, yeah, you, you'll be fine. You're a subject matter expert. You know your stuff. So I was just like, sure, how much work can it be writing a book like and planning a wedding? No, no big deal. And trying to launch my new course. So um, I agreed not knowing how much it would actually be. And it was a crazy, crazy ride. I, I was like studying how to write a book and it was just, it was a lot. And I am a procrastinator. So I actually waited until a few months in to even start writing the book. But I wound up getting it done by my deadline, which was shortly after my wedding. And uh, yeah, I don't, that was a st perhaps one of the most stressed I've ever felt. <laughs> but I'm so glad that I did it because it feels amazing to be able to call myself an author. I, I really hope people like the book. <laughs> it, you know, it just came out on Friday, if I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It was released in Europe uh, like a couple weeks before then. Um, I did a little book signing in Paris where I got to meet one of my my publishers, Dan, um, and that was awesome. And then it, it I, yeah, I just started seeing it come out in America this last week. So Nice. And it looks like uh, based on the title, again, it's something that would fit in very well with our audience here at Rec Poker. Yeah. Because we're... You know, let's face it, we're not playing a lot of $5,000 tournaments. We're playing a lot of dailies, 100, 200, you know, maybe $1,100 tournaments is that's a big step for us. So, oh, yeah, it looks sure. like it might fit really well with our audience. Yeah, totally. Okay. I'd like to know since you're so busy, you're doing all this stuff. Where and how do you find time to study? And what does that look like when you're actually studying poker? So, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, I, I study in a lot of different ways. Um, I have a, a study group of pros, um, some of them who have won multiple rings and and bracelets and stuff. So we meet, uh, we try to meet like once a week um, and just do like a big group study where it's very, very GTO heavy, um, which is not my favorite, <laughs> but I'm I'm trying to study a little bit more GTO. Um, and then when I private coach, I get to see a whole other perspective. So the, my students um, send me their hand history. So I get to I get to see their thought process. And I, I think that that actually helps me a lot, just kind of, you know, like I said, see a different perspective from people that maybe aren't as GTO. So um, reviewing their hands definitely, um, you know, helps my game a lot. And which is just a bonus because I absolutely love private coaching and, and just coaching in general. Um, and then um, 
I, I have a coach myself. I work with Matt Stout sometimes um, and uh, some others. And I, I just, yeah, I try to watch some pokercoaching.com videos and just try to stay up on my game, watch the high rollers on Poker Go. So yeah, I just do that more in my free time. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's that's how I, that, that's kind of how I study. It's kind of all a bunch of different like little things that come together for me. You have something there, Chris? Yeah, it's it's just the level of the field, you know, the 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 players are vastly different when you're playing $200 dailies to a 5k. So, it's I throw out all GTO like logic and just really play a more exploitative strategy and a lot of the concepts that I teach in my book are adjusting to different player types, um, you know. So, it's it's really all about opponent exploits and um, manipulating bet sizes based on, you know, like it's okay to, to manipulate your bet sizes, to get your opponent who is not paying attention to bet sizes and, and, you know, over folds and over calls and things like that. So you can, you can totally manipulate your sizes to get them to do what you want. So, um, like it's okay to size big when you have it against a calling station who doesn't know the, the, when they should be folding. Um, so it just kind of talks about those adjustments. And then I got a question from the YouTube chat here. Um, Jeff's wondering, um, what would you recommend for someone who's maybe a little bit older, uh, but who's only trying, has been trying to play seriously maybe for the last couple of years, but uh, has been losing? Um do you think they're a good candidate for private coaching? Do you think they need uh, to brush up on some other content first? What would you recommend as a first uh, step for Jeff? I think jumping straight to private coaching can be really beneficial because like, like I said, a lot of the coaching content out there, it, it can be hard to know where to start. And it it's probably the best thing for him to just get a coach to send hand histories to so that we or they can watch and and analyze their game and, and see what mistakes they're making that they don't necessarily see. And then we can guide them like, okay, it looks like you're really struggling with small blind strategy. So you should, you know, go and consume as much small blind strategy content as you can. Um, or, you know, you, your race for sin ranges are all, you know, kind of whacked. So I think, yeah, I think that would be good. Kind of, yeah, back, backwards map it, have a coach, identify your leaks, and then you go and take that information and, and really nail down the, the, you know, whatever content you can find on that. Do uh, you have something, John? Yeah, I had um, <clears throat> Kim Kilroy, who's a, a member of our Reckon crew and is often on these uh, calls. She happens to be in Ireland right now, so she can't be. Uh, but her statement is that a lot of women are coming into poker right now and um you know you mentioned that one of the reasons you were being sought out after as a coach might be because you're a woman and i was just wondering if that was from a lot of women because what women feel know that you'll be accommodating to women and aren't going to be a jerk or what's the <laughs> surprisingly enough i think i've only had like maybe five to seven female students, uh, private students out of the hundred plus that I've had, sad to say, um, maybe more, maybe more like eight, but I really don't think more than that. So, so 
basically, if there are any women that are looking for an accommodating coach, yeah. they should maybe head your way. Yes, for sure. <laughs> I'm actually uh, going to be working on a women's only course. I, I think that the market is lacking something like that. And, uh, you know, poker power does a great job with that, but, um, I want to, yeah, I, I want to off, I want to create something that I can offer women only who might feel intimidated to step in a poker room, because I do find that's a commonality between a lot of women who haven't played. Um, a lot of them say that they feel intimidated and they, you know, don't, they're afraid they're going to make mistakes and hold up the game. And so I want to create a, a course that kind of guides them through that. So um, you mentioned um, that you get together with a group of professional players and that's how you do some of your studying. And I know that on your vlog, you oftentimes will go through a hand history and give your thoughts of, of how you do it. So I'm assuming that you take notes on players oh, yeah. as you're playing. For sure. Now, do you do that? Uh, do you like make mental notes or are you putting notes down in your iPhone? Do you have a little pad of paper? How do you, what's that note taking process look like for you? So um, when I'm just playing a tournament with people that I've never played before, before with, or don't know, I don't like write down any notes in my phone. Um, I used to do that a lot when I used to play in private games. Um, I would list all of the players that I was playing with and I would write notes on them. And I, I still have those notes, but I haven't done that in a long time. And I probably should because um, I play in a, a card room here in Northern California where we have a vacation home and uh, it's the same players over and over and over. So I just like mentally know, you know, how, like, I just remember their, you know, their tells and their, you know, I, I know what kind of players they are, but I think it would be helpful if I took notes on them like, oh, this player, you know, four bet bluff me with seven, two, or, you know, I think notes like that would be helpful. So yeah, that, that's actually a good reminder. I should start doing that again. Did you have something again, Chris? Yeah, I've got a, f a few more for the, and this one actually really fits from the YouTube. Uh, uh, Jennifer's wondering uh, kind of relatedly what you recommend, I, I assume mostly live, what you recommend the best way to record hand histories that you might want to study later or might want to bring to a coach? Like what is, what is, what are some of the ways that you try to record some yeah. of the hands you played? That's a great question. Um, so there's two ways to do it. Um, one is just as soon as the hand is over to write it down on your phone, because it's so easy for you to forget every detail. And when it's fresh in your mind and it's, you know, if it's, if you do it as soon as the hand is over, you can look and see like, okay, I was this position, this player was this position, and these are the stack sizes. It's all right there. So write down as much information as you possibly can as soon as the hand is over. And if you don't feel like doing that, um, I, I tell people that they should do what vloggers do and they should, if it's allowed, um, you know, just, you don't even have to film the, the hand, I guess. Um, but what you can do is put your AirPod in or your headphone in and then hit record and like on your camera, your video camera, and then just speak the action as the hand is going on. So like, so that's what I'll do with my vlog. Um, so that I, so that I remember, so I don't have to write, you know, the hands after every time I I'm done with it. Um, so I'll say like under the gun open, under the gun one three bet and I did this and and then you could just send that recording to your coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got and a couple more uh, in the in the YouTube chat. Uh, Bo wonders uh, what is your favorite place to play poker? What's your favorite poker venue? So as far as like small small rooms, uh, the Casino Club here in Northern California is my favorite, um, just because it's you know my home casino and it's where you know i know everyone um as far as like vegas hotels i'd say when encore are the nicest uh the, the room at encore is the nicest i think um and i really like the seminal hard rock mm -hmm. in hollywood florida that's a good one too mm -hmm. i'd say seminal hard rock because that's where i've had like big scores um so that is like maybe my luckiest yeah. 
that, that always helps the memories of, of a place is it when it's uh, when you've run well there yeah um, for sure and for then sure. the last one uh neil is wondering uh, maybe some maybe somebody you know is wondering would bob win more poker tournaments if he listened to you more <laughs> yes <laughs> that's funny he actually does pretty well in tournaments i do have to give him credit um he is a private investigator so his the, the strongest part of his game are reads and tells like he like he just has a very good feel for what people are, are thinking um i i say he plays bto bomb theory optimal um, so if he just adopted a little bit of my strategy, I think it would help him, but actually he, it, it has like, since we got together, you know, I do coach him on a daily basis, like here and there, um, he's final table to WSOP event. He's won a couple rings. So, uh, he's, he's done well. Now I've, I've mentioned, I watch your vlog. So you just said that you you coach him every day, but it doesn't seem like he listens. Very well. No, exactly. That's why I have to do it every day. It's in one, out the other. But like sometimes like things will just get stuck in the middle. So that's. <laughs> and I just, I don't understand this more Bob thing, um, but that's another subject, but we won't get into that. <laughs> it's yeah, that's. Yeah, that's funny. It's just a hashtag I, I created in one of my first videos to see if my audience likes Bob. So I said, hey, guys, if you want to see more Bob, hashtag more Bob in the comments. And it just caught on like wildfire. And now we'll just hear it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Now we're going to ask for a look. We're going to ask for a lesson. OK. What are the common mistakes you see on the live tables? And we're probably talking more of the smaller stakes type okay. stuff that you might play. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, the biggest one I'd say is is open limping. Um, you definitely don't want, I mean, there's times where it's appropriate, but some players are just way too incredibly passive and they, you know, I, I'm not a fan of limp re-raising your strong hands, um, because it just looks so, so obvious. And typically like there isn't as much pre-flop aggression in small stakes where you're not going to get that opportunity to like, like, it's not like people are three betting super polarly. So, um, you're, you're just not going to get a chance to create a big pot and come in for the limp re-raise. Like oftentimes it's just going to limp around. So I think that, um, yeah, stop open limping so much. It's just a weak passive play. Um, aggression wins in poker. So a strategy of betting and raising and putting pressure on your opponents is going to yield you far more chips than being passive by limping and calling and things like that. So that's probably the biggest mistake I see. Um, also, yeah, I'd say just, um, playing too many hands, <laughs> uh, for sure is uh, definitely a common leak. I see like people are opening, you know, ace nine offsuit under the gun and things like that. So I'd say those are the two biggest things. I wonder if they're seeing the final table um, replays of these high level tournaments where somebody under the gun does raise with ace nine. Right, and right. So well, they think it's acceptable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it it's all a matter of like, if you're on the bubble and you have a big stack and everyone's being really tight, then yeah, you should be opening ace nine off. Or if you're, you know, like you said, at a high, high stakes final table and there's like metagame, 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 like then that's, that's fair. But no, as like in general, people are just overvaluing weak, you know, aces preflop and, and getting married to their, you know, aces, kings, queens on really bad textures, like nine, eight, seven suited, like five ways. Um, so yeah, things like that. I've got, I'm going to throw you a curveball now. Okay. What, what mistakes do you still make at the tables? Okay. What's your, what's your leap? Do you have one and are you yeah. aware of it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I have a few for sure. Um, I would say, um, I, I have a guilty pleasure. Sometimes I'll go down the TikTok rabbit while I'm playing the TikTok rabbit hole when I'm playing <laughs> and I'll just like scroll, 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 and I won't pay attention as much as I should. Um, so that's definitely a big leak I'm going to start working on for sure. And I find, I find the best thing I could do is just put my phone away 
which is hard because I vlog on my phone. So I have to, I have a work phone and a regular phone. So my personal phone, I just need to put away and, you know, just pay more attention. Um, Another thing that I struggle with, and I always try to do this, is waiting until it's my turn to look at my cards. I preach it. I say this is what you should do, but I have a tendency to, you know, even peel the first card before I'm even dealt the second card. And I just think that's a big leak. Um, so those are two that I can think of off the bat. I'm sure I have plenty more. <laughs> that's great. You got you got something else, Chris? Uh, just a couple more quick ones from from the chat here. Uh, Jennifer's asking, uh, when you're playing a series at casino, do you try and play the ladies' events if there is one? And how do you feel about ladies' events? Yeah, I love ladies' events. And that's so funny. I was talking with Bob earlier about how I need to play more of them. And there's a ladies' event at South Point, I think, next weekend that I'm going to play. Uh, I think it's like a 200 or 220 buy-in. Um for the Nevada State Ladies Championship or something. So I want to play that. I love ladies events. I think they're great. They're so much more fun than mixed fields. No offense, boys. Um, they're just <laughs> like, they're just fun. They're more chatty and it's just a good time. And I think it's a really good thing for the female community in general. And uh, for any female that's looking to get into poker, I think just start with a ladies event so that you're in an, you're in an, a comfortable environment. Women really want to help the other women. Um, so I think that would be something good to do if you're new to poker. Great. And then a uh, couple more, one more just came in that sort of related uh, BO wonders. Uh, any tips for handling obvious misogynists at the table? Yeah, I mean, you could, I'm not a fan of fighting fire with fire, so I wouldn't stoop to their level and start arguing with them. I would either put my AirPods in and just, you know, sometimes I'll put them in and not, you know, just not even listen to anything because then it kind of, you know, shows people you're not, you're not listening and you don't want to talk. And um, so you could do that. You could also obviously listen to music and not hear it at all. Um, or you could just tell the floor. I've, I've done that plenty of times. Yeah, they'll handle it for you. And uh, chat is just great today. The chat's blowing up. We've got a lot of hashtag more bobs in here. But one one last question showed up from JD wondering, uh, when you say J GTO isn't your favorite, what do you mean by that? What don't you like about it? Oh, I, I just hate studying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's not. I, I, I think that it's just, I, I think that you have to have a baseline understanding of GTO in order to deviate and exploit. Um, not, I think it's a fact you need to understand GTO to deviate. Um, but I just, I, I find it painful. <laughs> um, I, I just don't love working with solvers, but I, and I also think that it's very overrated for small stakes. Um, I don't think that, um, it's good to do, you know, what the solver says necessarily against people that don't understand GTO at all. And 95% of small stakes players don't understand GTO strategy. So um, that's what I mean when I said, I don't like it. Um, if you're playing five K's and, you know, three K's and things like that, then of course, like I'm going to go into GTO mode. Um, it's just not my favorite thing to study. I, I love studying human behavior more and the psychology and things like that. Solvers are boring. <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. Right. <laughs> I agree. Definitely. I mean, I, I'm like you, I do use them. Yeah. I do study them to try to get baseline strategy, but yeah. I'm much more involved in understanding what the other players are doing, which is wrong, which you can then exploit. Yeah, for sure. Joseph, do you have something here? I do. I do. Um, so it's nice to meet you, Lexi. I, I don't, I, I admit I don't know a lot about you because um, I don't consume as much poker content as everybody else. But I did look you up today and and looked at one of your videos. Um, and it said that you're a former attorney. Are you dropped out of law school? Did I get that correct? Yeah, um, yeah. Go ahead. So, sorry. No, 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 no. So, it, which is interesting to me because I think one of the questions that I've asked multiple uh, coaches is how they manage expectations for players. 90% of people do not make money in this in this uh, field, but I understand the concept of a financial planner wants to drive in a nice car and say, well, I've made all this money. 
but it's probably unrealistic for the vast majority of people to essentially accomplish that. Yeah. And because we talk about recreational players, the likelihood of them winning, I'm sorry if I'm ruining everybody's day, but of winning millions of dollars in this field is very, very, very low. Mm -hmm. So given that you're asking people to spend a fair amount of money per hour to, for coaching, how do you manage that expectation for them to say, look, this is a really, really hard game. At the same time, you can win, but it's not quite as much as you see in the big videos that everybody uses to draw people to their site. Yeah, no, that's a really good question and a really good point. Um, with my course, I don't promise profitability. Um, I promise um, enjoying the game more by having a better understanding of how to play. And with the knowledge that you're consuming, uh, and if you complete the course, then you should be able to be a winning player. Um, but it's impossible to promise that because there is an element of luck that is unavoidable in poker. So I more say for the people that are signing up for my course, um, you know, it's, it's more of, you know, people looking, people that didn't understand or didn't know that playing poker could be a profitable hobby or a side hustle where you can make, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks to pay your shopping bill or this or that, you know, you can make some, some little money, um, depending on how much you play and what stakes you're playing. Um, of course you can make some big money as well, but I, I don't even know if legally I can promise profitability. Um, so, and as far as, uh, I'm not a, an attorney, I, I have a degree in political science and I was studying for the LSATs before I decided to go pro. So, and I just okay. <laughs> throw <her> out, <laughs> which thrilled my parents. So. <laughs> so how much pushback do you get then from players who come in and you start to explain that? And then they're like, wait a minute, this is why I signed up. And then you get people like escaping and going to somebody that says, sure, you're going to make millions if you follow my system. I haven't had anybody complain yet. <laughs> um, so I guess that's, that's good. Um, it's yeah, I don't have a sales team that's like, going out trying to get sales. So, um, but I actually am going to be building a team. So I guess I do have to make that clarification. And if people want to turn away because I can't promise profitability, then, then, you know, they probably shouldn't be playing poker anyway, because <laughs> it's very, very hard to be profitable in poker. And it took me years, um, two years probably of really putting in a ton of volume and studying a ton to become a profitable player. So um, I think people really do need to have that realistic expectation and understand the variance in poker and understand, especially in live poker, that you can go on a downswing for years. <laughs> a year, well, maybe not years, but a year for mm -hmm. sure. So Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting too, because it, it's when I look around at the poker sphere, we're talking about solvers, which are incredibly complex statistical modeling of how people are gonna play and very smart people are coming into the game and still losing money at it. So I, it's 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 nice to hear that you have a means of kind of letting people understand where they play because otherwise they end up angry and frustrated year after yeah. year and saying, what's wrong with me? Right. Yeah, and it's interesting because I actually do find that a lot of my students are like lawyers and continuation bed psychologists and like people with like a high level, you know, status. So it's like interesting <laughs> that, it, and I always put the disclaimer in the beginning. I always tell them poker's a journey. It's going to take a lot of work. And um, yeah. So I do think that with like studying and putting in the, the work and effort and the volume that you can be a winning poker player. Like I, I want to be able to promise that, but it really comes down to you and how much you work on your game and how much you're playing. Yeah, I, and I, th I would I would agree with two things there. I mean, I think that you absolutely can. It's just people underestimate the amount of work that yeah. goes into that. And I also want to absolutely agree with you that psychologists are a high status position in the world and should really be respected at all times. Are you a so, are you a psychologist? I'm a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, cut him off. <laughs> cut him <laughs> off. <laughs> Thank you for answering. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. That's funny. Chris, do you have something else? Yeah, one 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 more coming in from uh, YouTube. Um, Jeremy's wondering saying while solvers are boring how important is the pre-flop solver fundamentals like charts for mtts 
even at lower stakes. Like, so maybe we don't need to go into like the whole game tree of a GTO thing, but for a player who's starting out and thinking about MTT approach, even at those like hundred dollar daily tournaments, how important are charts and thinking about that in terms of their approach? Super important, like super, super important. Stick to the charts because your opponents at the small stakes are going to make mistakes and you want them to not, you know, pay attention to the charts and not, not play a correct preflop range, but you should be. Um, and you can, you can adjust the, you know, you can widen your ranges based on how tight your table is. So the, the tighter they are, the wider you can widen, the more you can widen those ranges and the more aggressive they are, you should be tightening those ranges. But if you, you really, I think that's the first thing that people should study are preflop charts. I agree with that a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, yes. Like you said earlier, when you talked about the mistakes that people are making at the table, they're playing too many hands. They're limping too many hands. Yeah. So if you're playing a GTO starting range, you are going to have a better range than them yeah. in most cases. So yeah. you're already starting with an advantage in every hand. Exactly. Yeah. If you have mistakes in your preflop game, you're just setting yourself up for uh, failure postflop. And I see that a lot in the games that I play for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Chris, do we have, um, are we ready for stake study stack? Yeah. So Lexi, I don't know if anyone uh, uh, warned you about this, but uh, so no. we have a no, new, we didn't. <laughs> all right. We have a new segment uh, on uh, the show where we have a game we play called stake study stack. I'm going to give you three names of people and you have to choose one that you want to stake in a okay. cash game or tournament, one who you want to study with, and one who you just like to take all their chips at the table. As a matter of fact, I think you guys just had Matt Affleck on. Yeah. And did them yep. Because he said stack Lexi. Yeah. Yeah. Well, funny <laughs> enough, his name might might show up here. We'll, we'll just see. Oh, we'll just see. Okay. We'll just see. All right. So the three names I have for you are Jonathan Little. Matt Affleck and Bob Mather. <laughs> oh man, I so want to get Matt back. <laughs> Matt is so good, and I I really would love to study with Matt. Um, so I'll say study with Matt, even though he's wanted to stack me. Um, stake Jonathan, stack Bob. <laughs> <laughs> i love stacking bob <laughs> i love it love it yeah that's great that's fantastic yeah all right we have another segment that we've started recently and it's called close the action and this is where we're going to ask you a bunch of questions and you don't have any time to react or think you just answer you know as quick as you can and if there's a question you don't want to answer you can just say pass okay okay so we're gonna go, we're gonna go through some questions, and I I got a list of them here that Jim put together. I don't know if I'm gonna hit them all, but we'll we'll see what your reaction is to some of these. Okay. Uh, favorite poker hand. Aces. Oh, of course. Poker, gamble or skill. Skill. Your biggest poker peeve. Um, eating finger foods at the table. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? I've never seen it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Is Ace King a drawing hand? Yes. Well, no. It's a great hand. I love Ace King. So it's both. <laughs> What's the code word for not chopping blinds? For not chopping? Yes. For not chopping? Play? <laughs> okay, good. I'm just, we're, we're, we're doing an experiment on that. We're okay. just, we'll, we'll fill you in on that a little later. Okay. All right. Um, is a hot dog sandwich? No. Is a taco a sandwich? No. Is a pop tart a sandwich? No. <laughs> so none of those are a sandwich. All right. <laughs> Should vacations be lazy or busy? Both. And I think we already asked this question, your favorite poker venue. 
Uh, who is one player you respect and why? Chrissy Foxen. Uh, she's one of my best friends and she is amazing. And I think she is the best female player in the world. Yellow light coming up. Are you going to slow down or speed up? Speed up. <laughs> What's your favorite childhood family holiday meal? Uh, my parents do an unbelievable Christmas spread. It's got everything you can imagine. So I'm just going to say the Gavin family Christmas spread. Nice. Nice. Are you pro chop or no chop? No chop. Who is your poker nemesis? Pass. Besides Bob. Pass. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you're not going to say, it. you're not going to give us. Right. No. <laughs> um, what is one thing you can't live without? My husband. Wonderful. Great answer. And it looks like based on our scoring system, you scored an amazing 1,650 points. Nice. Out of? <laughs> Out of infinity. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, not so nice. <laughs> no, there's really no points to it. We just throw that out there. <laughs> All right. Um, do we have any more questions for Lexi? I have one thing that I'd like to talk about that I'm doing. All right. That'd be great. What is kind it? Of, it's kind of uh, different. So I get a lot of comments on my feet. So I've what? decided to start an OnlyFans for my feet. No, come on. Yeah. Are you? No, you're kidding, right? <laughs> Yeah, April. I suddenly have questions. <laughs> oh man, you didn't believe it. <laughs> no way. No way. Yeah, April Fool. Who, who's Thanks. ever even seen your feet? I I actually have gotten comments on my feet when I played on uh, the main event final, uh, the main event feature table on ESPN. Uh, I was in flip flops, and I got some tweets from. Uh, this guy whose like handle had like a foot in it. So I guess he has foot oh. fetish and oh, he was be, yeah. like obsessed with my feet and like would tag me and feet pics. And he took a screenshot of my feet. It was very <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> well, I afraid? thought that you guys are going to believe that. No, you maybe you did believe it. You weren't sure. <laughs> no, I didn't believe it. Okay. I didn't believe are you, word of it. Are you, are you a fan of uh, girls five ever the, the show on TV? Oh, no, I haven't watched it, but I saw it and I was going to watch it. Uh, if, in the third season, there's a there's a little um, there's a running joke about uh, one of the one of the person's feet and they have a uh, feetopedia or something about about different feet and, and things <laughs> like that. it's very funny if, if you get a chance. Is uh, it a good it show? Oh, it's, it's fabulous. It, oh, it's fabulous. good. Yeah, okay. I got very, one. very funny. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, Lexi. Good call. Um, good call. You you uh, you got me. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm surprised. I didn't come up with any April Fools jokes for today. I wasn't even thinking about that. So, if people want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do it? lexigavinmather.com. Uh if you go visit that and go to sign up for the free training, um you can enter your email and then you can ask me questions there. I always respond. Also, you have a newsletter. Um, and I am I do get the newsletter. So what should I expect to see when I get your newsletter? Um, so it's gonna be a new course. Um, when I come out with a new course, uh, I'm actually gonna be um starting the newsletter up again. I have I haven't set one out in a little bit. Okay. Um, but yeah, anytime I make a new course, what my upcoming schedule is. Um, we have the world series poker coming up, so I am going to be vlogging that. I don't know if I'm going to do every day, which is what I've done for the last two years. Um, but probably one a week, if not more, I might end up doing one, you know, a daily video, who knows? Um, but check that out at Lexi Gavin poker on YouTube again, Lexi with a Y and, uh, I'm Lexi Gavin poker on all my social media as well. So I'll, I'll be updating for the series, uh, on all my channels. Now I watched every single daily vlog last year. Stop on it! Series of poker. Yeah, I did every day. Oh. I'd watch you, and I'd watch that other guy, uh, 
Negroni? Real kid poker or whatever it is, oh, whatever guy. his name yeah. is. Yeah. That kid poker guy. Yeah. Um, but I'd watch you every day and mm -hmm. I was amazed that um I was and one of the thoughts I had was, is that distracting for you to, you know, from the standpoint of focusing on your game when you're <laughs> making sure that you're creating content while you're doing it? Yeah, it's a lot. The World Series grind is a lot in and of itself. And then to add the daily vlogs on top of it, it it's a lot. And, uh, you know, it's not just making the vlog, it's doing the thumbnails, doing the titles, the descriptions. So it it's a lot. So um, Naranu this year decided to do, as far as um, tournaments, he's trying to focus more on quality over quantity. And I'm going to try to do that as well. So maybe a few less tournaments than I normally do. And a few less vlogs as well. <laughs> and then I, I'm still going to, I think my plan is to do one vlog a week uh, and just recap everything that I've played that week. So I'm still in, like going to be doing a little bit of filming every day, but it's not going to be as much. That's my plan. I'm like I said, I might end up <laughs> last minute deciding to do every day because I'm well, whatever, of... whatever you end up doing, I'm sure I'll be watching it. Thank so you. I appreciate I it. I love it. I love it. So is there anything else you want to end with before we go on to our other features? I think that's it for me. Good. Any other questions from anybody? All and right, if you want to purchase my book, uh, visit dnbpoker.com. Yes. And we have permission to give away one of your uh, digital copy of your book today from the boys at DNB. They're the best. So when... We want to, people to start putting food bank into the chat on YouTube because we're going to be giving away a digital copy of Lexi's new book, uh, Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Tournaments. So start putting food bank in to the chat. And thank you very much, Lexi. You're great. You're a great ambassador of the game. And I look forward to watching your vlogs. Thank you so much. It was awesome chatting with you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. And now we're going to go to John Somsky, and he's going to tell us all about the home games for the last week or so. Well, before we do that, I just wanted to announce that I am going to actually open up an OnlyFans for the blurry image of the door in my background. I've heard <laughs> lots of people saying they wanted more of it. So, you know, it, it'll all be with the door closed. I'm not going to be opening the door at all, but there will be lots of um, blurry OnlyFans pictures available. Nice. So not not just, of your uh, feet? What? No, not, not my feet. feet. <laughs> I will not be in the pictures. That's, that's also been requested. Um, so you can just contact Chris at rec.poker for any information about the blurry black door. Only fans. Uh, first thing <laughs> is we are coming up on April. This is the first of April, and that means that it is time for our Go for the Gold tournament. If you have ever won a silver pin, of which I have not, but if you have ever won a silver pin, then you are eligible to play in the Go for the Gold tournament, which will be Wednesday, April 17th. There is only one more opportunity to win a silver pin prior to that, and that will be for if you won a tournament in March, which, again, I did not, um, then you will be able to play in the March Tournament of Champions, which will be taking place on uh, April 8th. And the winner of that will also be eligible to play in the Gold for the Gold series. So this is your opportunity and, to win a gold pin. And John, there's only currently one gold pin recipient in all of history, right? Is that correct? Correct. Only so, one person in the entire lifetime of the game has ever won a gold pin. And do you know who that person is? Yes. Spot Donlin. Oh, you're right. Yeah, well, that's it, of course. And Daniel to, Kennedy. I knew that I would know the answer when I heard it, but I could not remember <laughs> to come up with it. So thank you there, Rob. Um, now we're, we'll go, go on to our uh, series. 
On March 25th, E. Anderson 85, Eric Anderson got his second nightly victory for the year. Shark Slayer 21, Lucky Hawes got his first nightly victory for the year. LL Tahoe got his or her second nightly victory for the year. Jay Sedum, Jeff S., got his first daily mixed victory for the year. Larson's opening, George Borden, got his second international victory for the year. The Took, Brian Cole, got his first international victory for the year. And Swedish 5077 Lars won the LPP event. So he can contact info at rec.poker for his free month at Learn Pro Poker. Thank you, John. Um, since today is April 1st, we would normally have the ROI for the month of March. But I had to wait for the tournament last night to be done to download the stats for that. So I, I don't have it quite ready yet. So hopefully next week you can see the uh, ROI stats for March. Okay, Chris, do we have a... We've got, we've got some entries in here. We've got five, uh, five entries so far. So I'm going to pull out my uh, six-sider. And the order I have it is Charles Allen, Jennifer Galloway, uh, J.D. Malay, Jeff Cat, and K. Poker Wannabe. So that'll be one, two, three, four, five. Um, and if I roll a six, I will re-roll. And um, no, you can, you can, Chris, you can. Oh, you can put, actually, uh, number six just came in. Jeremy Herb. So we'll put we'll put twenty dollars because you didn't roll. Oh, somebody won. Well, no, somebody came in with and is now number six. Oh, number six. Okay, well then, then there's no seven sided dice. Yeah, there's so no seven sided dice. Better. So away we go. <laughs> uh, we've got and our winner is uh, it's a one. Charles Allen, B chip. Great. So Charles, just uh, email info at rec poker, and we'll set you up with a digital copy of Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Tournaments by Lexi Gavin Mather. All right, is there anything else anybody wants to add? Uh, I will add that we are starting our new book study on Wednesday. So anybody watching us live, please note that on Wednesday, we're starting our next book study, which is Excelling at No Limit Poker. Um, it's by Jonathan Little. It's published by D&B Books. And it is actually a list of everybody you've ever heard of that's written a poker book. Um, has one of the chapters in the book. So it is an interesting read. You can get to a lot of viewpoints from a lot of different players. So join us on Wednesday, uh, 6.30 Central Time, and we'll be starting our first session of Excelling at No Limit Poker. I got one thing, Rob, and uh, sure. that is um, if you're watching live, not listening um, on, the, uh, on the podcast uh, tomorrow, is the finale of Ma Rec Madness. So uh, tune in uh, Twitch, uh, TV backslash Rec Poker. Um, and we'll be on the call. It'll be an exciting uh, matchup. And we'll see who, who wins this year's edition of Ma Rec Madness. All right. We've got to give a, get a handout to John there because I believe John's in the final four. And he did it by beating a notable poker player last week. So uh, hats off to you, John. It was a great win. Thank you. And we also have another member of the Final Four on this esteemed panel. Right oh, here Joe. Well. Joe yes. has made it to the Final Four. How did that happen, Joe? Paid somebody off. So. <laughs> <laughs> Slip, slip read, you know, 20 bucks to get out of his basement and another hundred to actually, <laughs> with, you know, get into the final four. So, you know, it's <laughs> uh, chump change for you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. If nobody's got anything. Oh, one, uh, one other thing I want to mention that our sponsor obviously is running aces poker. And in April, April 18th to the 28th, I believe they are running the MSPP will be coming to Running Aces. And so everybody um, that's interested in the MSPT and Running Aces Poker, they are hosting the event and should be a good one. So 
I'm sure Keith will be there. <laughs> All right. Okay, if that's it, then uh, we will end this episode. Thanks, everybody, for coming.